Hey, I'm Bob Runkel, and for as long as I can remember, I've loved pop culture. Despite the challenges I've faced in my life, pop culture has always been there for me. I love talking to people and being a platform for others to share their thoughts and stories. Because if there's one thing I never get tired of, it's seeing driven, talented, and inspiring individuals follow their dreams, no matter what obstacles are in their way. And I know a thing or two about that. Welcome to the DJ Bob Show. I'm DJ Bob. Roll it. The DJ Bob Show. Pop culture, past and present. And now, here's your host, DJ Bob. What can I say about Bill Sherman? Hamilton, In the Heights, Sesame Street, Don Quixote, and just a wonderful guy. We talked to him about it all, and it kind of goes all over the place. And I love it. And I hope you do too. Enjoy. I'm so excited to have you back here. It's been, it's been a little bit. Absolutely. But you've been busy. Your your social media tells all the things. <laughs> Thank you for keeping up with us here. Of course. It's cool. Um, so for those that don't know who you are, would you mind giving a quick little elevator pitch? Sure. Uh, my name is Bill Sherman. I, uh, among other things, am the music director of Sesame Street. Uh, I also write songs for a number of cartoons, including Nature Cat for PBS and Don Quixote. I'm also the executive music producer of the In the Heights film and the soundtrack and the upcoming Tick, Tick, Boom film for Netflix. And... I'm a parent. I have two small children who are eight and ten, and uh, uh, I guess that's it. Well, that, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> so, how how did you get to be doing all of those things? How did what were your beginnings? Sure. Um, uh, let's see. I grew up on Long Island. I, uh, was a big music fan. I played the saxophone. That was sort of my thing for a while. Um, uh, I was into jazz and hippie bands and band, rock bands that had saxophones in them. Uh, I went to Wesleyan university in 1998. I, uh, studied music there, West African music, particularly. I went to Ghana my junior year of college to study music there. Uh, I met Lynn manuel Miranda when I was 19 or 20, I think. Uh, and he uh, asked me to music direct one of his musicals. And we started working together. We graduated from college. Uh, we worked on, uh, he was a substitute teacher. I was a computer tech at MTV. And during our lunch breaks, we would work on In the Heights uh, at the drama bookshop, the now new drama bookshop, used to be the old drama bookshop. Uh, and um, we developed in the Heights for a number of years. Uh, it, it went to Broadway in 2008. We did that for a little bit. We, um, he went on to do Hamilton. I went on to work at Sesame Street for a while, uh, amongst other things. Uh, then what happened? He, uh, oh, and then Hamilton happened and sort of blew the whole world up and we produced that record. And then uh, fast forward till now, we just came out with In the Heights film, completing a sort of 20 year odyssey of, craziness and uh here we are i guess that sums it up i mean some other things happened along the way yeah uh, <laughs> i had a kid i had two kids not that i personally had them but i there's two kids and uh you know i moved around a couple times and here i am so what is it like sort of like producing uh, the hamilton record because you the one thing before disney plus that put Hamilton into everybody's ears, you know? Mm -hmm. What can't like producing a cast album that will last? <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, at the, at, the, at the time of making it, you don't know. I mean, when we made the Hamilton cast record, it was like just Hamilton had been off Broadway, was, had moved to Broadway and was just like the, the excitement was like pretty palpable. Um, and then I think, you know, in the past, when you make cast recordings, it's just you want to capture what's on the stage 
and just sort of have that for posterity and archive and whatever. And I think what Atlantic Records and the producers wanted us to do was to make like a record as opposed to just making an archive. And so we went out of our way to really record it like a record. We took a long, we took our time with it. We didn't sort of just like set up a couple microphones in a room and press record. And, uh, you know, we brought in some heavy artillery, including the roots to sort of work with us to give it, you know, as much of a hip hop vibe as we could. Um, and uh, we mixed it for a long time and we brought in really heavy guys to mix it and master it. And we really spent our time making what I think is like not only a good capture of the musical itself, but is it's in it, like you said, is its own thing. And, uh, and it was a really gratifying experience and it was really fun. I think we had the best thing we did is we really had a good time making it. And it's so much music that it at times was like fairly overwhelming just because there's so many songs and so much music. But, um, but for the most part, it was a really enjoyable experience. Be thankful you didn't add that finale thing. Yeah. It would have been <laughs> another track. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and probably when you're doing all those Mickey, you don't need another one. That's right. I couldn't stand any more music with that one. It was a long one. So when, when you know, Hamilton becomes this big thing, Hike was huge too, and we'll get into that because Hike is in the zeitgeist for everybody. I mean, Hike was my first cast album when I was 13 years old because <laughs> I saw the Tonys that, that Sunday and then bought it the Tuesday. So... I was engrossed in it when nobody knew who Lynn was, when mm. nobody knew who you were, at least in my area. Mm. So, um, so bringing Hike to the screen, were you hesitant? No, I don't think hesitant. I think I was just like super excited. I was also just, I guess, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is. I guess worried, I guess uh, skeptical. You know, it's just it, something that you you started so long ago. And for me, it's like, like not only do I associate In the Heights with like my first major job, my first musical, my first big experience in entertainment. Uh, I was also a kid and I can also like track my life, other life events to what I was doing at in the Heights while these other things were happening, which is very surreal. Um, uh, but then when it was time to put it on the screen, you know, you just like how in the Heights was successful as a musical, a theatrical musical, it was about this team of me and Lynn and Alex and Tommy Kale and Kiara and Andy Blankenbuehler. And then for, for the movie, it was the same thing. It was, it was, was me and Alex and Lady Kiara, and then like John Chu, who was the director who came in with like this very distinct vision of what the movie should be. And we sort of like got on his back and rode his idea all the way, uh, all the way to the end. And it was a really interesting experience to take something that I had so, that had so become part of my DNA and really rethink it, not only sonically, but like uh, the breadth of it and what it meant to people and what it means now versus what it means then. And then also like digging into my experiences over the past 20 years to really make the best version of In the Heights as, as humanly possible, which is certainly the movie. Is there anything necessarily, is there anything that you necessarily like better in the movie soundtrack than the Broadway cast recording? Um, I think like, you know, when we made the movie, we had the ability to just be grander and bigger. So like something that was a synth patch on a keyboard in the musical, because we could only use what's in the pit is like a full orchestra, right? So like the breadth of it is much bigger. And then what we were able to do for the film is uh, we brought in like really heavy hip hop producer and really heavy Latin producer to sort of really get those types of music to sing. So like, uh, 96,000 and uh, the opening and blah, blah, blah are produced. We produced with Mike Elizondo, who's this famous hip hop producer. And then the Latin stuff was produced with this guy named Sergio George, who's this famous Latin music producer. And so having their expertise sort of intertwined with what we did for the Broadway versions really made it sort of jump off the screen, jump into your lap and get it, you know, really make it the 2.0 version. So when you when you got when you got the cast in to record, was was it like kind of like 
wow, we're actually doing this sort of deal. Yeah, I, so we brought in a lot of the original uh, cast, the original Broadway cast to do a lot of the ensemble stuff. And they were all pretty much freaking out. And then the people who were new at it, it was interesting, similar to you, like, like the kid who played uh, Sonny in the Heights was the first musical he ever saw. And so he has a relationship to it. And then, oh, you know, yeah. the guy, the, the woman who played Vanessa, like she's from Mexico, but she had had a certain relationship in Heights. And weirdly, uh, uh, the majority of the people involved were very, had a very specific relationship to it, as did I. And so we would all share those kind of stories and stuff, which was really fascinating. And, um, and it, it gave everybody like a very distinct way in, like a very distinct way to, to contribute to the overall movie because they all came from different backgrounds, but yet all had this musical in common and all wanted to make the best story possible. So I feel like all of those things combined together really made the best product. I mean, I, I loved it. <laughs> I, it, it was so cool. Did you see the picture I posted of like the side by side of like the, the, cast recording and the soundtrack i think i tagged you in it or something yes i think i yes i did it's a, it's wild right how much time has gone by in those that the, between those two yeah. things but you know what's interesting is they they both they sound similar the songs still remain very intact you yeah know? but even then when i was listening to it it still had it was still current but now it's even more you, I could even hear it more on top forty radio or Latin radio. It just the new mixing and the new production adds a whole new breath to it. Mm -hmm. right? For sure. So I kind of wanted to dive in deep with you about children's television for a little mm -hmm. bit, and you worked on Sesame Street for what thirteen years? I think this is eleven. 12, 12. I, I just didn't know the timeline. <laughs> um, so did you have a chance to, and I wanted to ask you like when it happened, but did you have a chance to work with Adam Schlesinger? I, 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 I did. So Adam, this is a funny story. I, I met, uh, I got nominated for a Tony for In the Heights and the, uh, for all these award shows, there's like a lunch or something before they happen. And so I was seated at, seated at a table next to Adam Schlesinger at the Tony luncheon. So he was there for Crybaby, I think. Um, yeah. And we were sitting next to each other. We were shooting the shit. And then I said, I'm the music director of Sesame Street. He said, no way. That's the coolest job ever. And I was like, well, you're in Fountain of Wayne and Fountain's Wayne. And I think that's the coolest job ever. And so we got to talking. We exchanged numbers. And then projects would come up at Sesame street that I thought he'd be great for. And he would write songs for us. So he did a song for Brad Paisley. He did a song, he, the original Elmo, the musical, the theme song he wrote. And then he did a song called, I wonder that, that Ernie wrote. That's my he's favorite. This, yeah. And he's this amazing, amazing songwriter, amazing, amazing human being. And sadly left us, you know, a year or so ago. And he, it's one of the saddest things ever. I, he, we, we, we hadn't worked together in a while, but he, is one of the best songwriters that I know and uh, one of the best people that I knew, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting because a month prior to his death, we spoke with um, Tom Everett Scott mm -hmm. and we talked about that thing you do and how that was Adam's first thing. And then a month later, you know. And yeah, I know. It's, it's terrible. I, I just wanted to bring that up to you because we haven't talked since. So, um, and so as far as Sesame Street, I does the does the does the journey start a little bit earlier at a metric company? Yeah. So what happened was, uh, in the early days before all the in the height stuff, we did Freestyle Love Supreme, you know, which is that hip hop group that I play in, where we get suggestions from the audience and make up hip hop songs. Um, and uh, uh, when the electric company was starting out, the woman who's the executive producer of the electric company, her name is Karen Fowler, had come to see Freestyle Love Supreme and wanted to sort of base the new electric company off of the, I don't know, improvisatory nature of Freestyle Love Supreme. So we got involved very early and we were like in the early pilots of the new electric company and blah, blah, blah. And then when it got picked up by Sesame Workshop, 
I somehow, <laughs> I was really young. I had no idea what I was doing. I sort of parlayed that into being like, hey, can I be the music director? And they were like, okay, but being like, and but knowing full well that I had no idea what I was doing. So I sort of learned on the job and we made like 60 episodes of The Electric Company in a year and a half. And it was just like a full on crazy experience. And, uh, and I was there, I was there, I was there. And then as uh, The Electric Company was sort of shutting down, uh, Sesame Street was looking to overhaul their thing. So the, the music department, so the guy who, you know, the, the, the original music supervisor who also passed away a few years ago was uh, Danny Epstein. And he had been there since 1969. And so it was a humongous shoes to fill for sure. And um, uh, yeah, and then I, I sort of interviewed there for a year or so and then finally got the job there. And I've been there ever since uh, in what is still to this day, the most surreal job title I think a person can possibly have, so. And at the most surrealist place. Absolutely. Which is very funny because if I remember correctly, you did not grow up watching the street. <laughs> That's right. It's one of my sad uh, admittances is that I was like a G.I. Joe Thundercats kind of guy. And so, uh, I mean, that's cool too, but <laughs> <laughs> I thought so, but you know, so it, like, and I think I've told you the story last time we spoke, which is people will ask me all of this very insider baseball knowledge about Sesame street. And initially I had no idea what they were talking about because I didn't watch it. And, and now, and now of course I do because I've been there in a long time. Yeah. But, but what did you know <laughs> about Sesame street? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I know about the puppets and I knew about, you know, I knew about, uh, the, the the people who were there and I knew about some of the songs like you know like growing up if you ever get into Stevie Wonder you undoubtedly google superstition and if you google superstition what comes up is Stevie oh, Wonder performing on the set yeah it's one of the best things ever and it's all these kids just sitting around while they're playing through superstition super cool and I felt like that was dope and then and then Billy Joel playing um just the way you are, I think, or something yeah, like that. He, and and, and like Ray, Taylor too. Ray, Ray Charles, like people who I grew up with, you know, and loved. And then they were on Sesame Street. And then when it got later, it was like in sync and Destiny's Child and um, you know, Feist and all of those other things. And so then uh, you know, and then when I got the job, I went, I went on a full deep dive and just sort of listened to everything and you know, really got as much of it into my bones as possible. So what do you tell me your favorite song you've written? I mean, I've, I've written so many. The ones I like the most are like the, the ones that I didn't expect to be great. So like um, Janelle Monet, The Power of Yet and uh, um, Bruno Mars, Don't Give Up. And I will say that the first song I ever wrote, second song I ever wrote for Sesame Street was What I Am, the Will I Am song. Um, and I just, you know, we just wrote it as like a, could be a cool song and it wound up being this great anthem. And it's one of the things that I get asked about most it ended uh, up being on the Macy's parade. <laughs> like yeah. You. yeah. And people, and people perform it at, at preschools and kindergartens and things. And that's always very gratifying. And then more recently, like I just did a song with Dave Grohl about um, uh, traveling across the country with Big Bird. And that was really fun too. And he's, he's a super great guy. And it's, you know, I think the best thing about Sesame street is people, have their own relationship to it and really want to, when they're invited to be on it, really want to do great. And so you have people who are really at the top of their game coming to, to participate, which is wonderful. One of the kind of more funny, just because of style, is the Nick Jonas. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. So, so I wrote that, I remember, so, <laughs> One day, if I can find it, I'll send you the demo of me singing that song. But I remember that we booked Nick Jonas and I got sent these lyrics about the shape song. And at the time he was like transitioning between the Jonas Brothers and his solo career. And he had all this like super like R&B type yeah. pop. And I was like, I can write songs like that. But I, I like I said that to myself. That doesn't mean that I like really could. And then it just that song. I, that's like what I was talking about before, like a surprise. Like I. uh uh, I wrote that song in like 10 minutes because I just like, I knew what it had to be. And so like, you know, when you, when you figure it out in your head, this is what I do is like, I'll walk around and I'll whatever. And if I figure it out in my head, I'll sing it into my phone. Then I'll come downstairs to my studio and do it. So usually that whole process, if I, if I'm really nailing it, takes like 15 to 20 minutes. And so I wrote, check that shape, like in 15 or 20 minutes, because I just knew what it had to be. And then I sent it 
to Chris Jackson to sing just so I could have like a good singing voice on it. And he, uh, he said back this, you know, he had, he had embellished a few things, but like, it was super cool. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the song that went to print. And then I remember going into the studio in LA with Nick Jonas and I had no idea what to expect. And he was like the most professional and like incredible singer I had ever worked with up until that point. Like he was, he was like, I call him the vocal assassin because like, he's just sort of like came in and had these like parts in his head and he like heard it and he just nailed it. And I was so impressed and he was really just a joy to work with and really nailed the song. So when you're recording with these celebrities, don't name names obviously, but is there ever like a celebrity who, I don't want that sort of like tree shit, like a kid show or are they all pretty cool they're all pretty cool and they're all pretty into it what i do say to them i was like hey uh don't treat this like a kid's show just treat it like you're recording your next album yeah that's and, good and the other thing that i say to them is like uh i want this to be as fun an experience for you as possible so like if there are things you want to add to the song or embellish or create like i'm totally into that and most of them are just so happy to be on the show that they just crush it like and they they will do it on their own in their own studios at home one one celebrity recorded like in the basement of Madison Square Garden before a show. A couple of them, excuse me, did it on their tour buses. Like they'll do whatever you want because they're so happy to be there. So it's great. Oh, Macklemore, he arrived at like 7 a.m. to like record the vocal because he was so into it, wanted to be there and stuff like that, you know? So that's fun. Yeah. So, yeah, it's great. Because, you know, when not, not much now, but like when some people hear a kid's show, they think of this like, condescending cute thing and you never know what people are gonna think so that's like a question I had as far as how people treat it because it is an important part of our culture yes, absolutely street. absolutely when I took the job I, I I did two things one is I totally overhauled the department and two was like I wanted I think when people talk about Sesame Street uh, I think they get a certain sound in their head, which was the sound that Joe Raposo created in, you know, years ago, which is like that sort of vaudevillian, like jazzy something or other. Like, which is great. Which but- is awesome. But I, but I, and I definitely pay homage to that. And I, we definitely still do write songs like that. But what I wanted to do was uh, write songs for Sesame Street and redefine it as something that my kids would listen to on the radio. And, and, this thing I always say, which is what I do is every time I write a song, I play it for my kids to see if like it sticks to them because I find that those are the most successful songs. And if they're singing it five or 10 minutes later, then I feel like I've really succeeded both as parent and as songwriter, because then, you know, they're learning something and uh, they, they think my melody is good because they listen to pop music all day. So for something to actually stick to them sonically is a, is a great achievement. And I don't think rarely on Sesame Street there there are like auto-tuned vocals unless you're doing a style parody. Yeah. We did one thing, I remember, with the teeth brushing with Elmo where we auto-tuned his phone. Yeah. But for the most part, no, we don't auto, I mean, we tune some things just for to nail the pitches, but there's not, it's not, there's not a lot of processing done at all. And tell me about like, from Demo to final delivery, that process. So the way it works with Sesame Street is a lot of the scripts, the lyrics are written by the script writers. I'll be handed scripts or pages of lyrics and, you know, see where they're set and what's happening. Like if something's set on a farm, do I go more bluegrass or country? Or if something's set in a whatever, you know. And so then I figure out what kind of song it is to me. And then I, you know, I sort of go through my Rolodex of composers, my Sesame Street composers and figure out like who writes the best version of this song. So like if it's a pop anthem, I go to my pop anthem guys. If it's like a vaudevillian thing, I go to my vaudeville guy. And then if it's something I like, then I'll write it. And so I figure that out and I send it to them or I do it and I write it and we get it back and um, goes to the producers who, you know, uh, either confirm or deny that it's good. Uh, And then, um, uh, we figure out what it's shooting. We blah, blah, blah. Then we record all the vocals. Uh, and then, uh, the, then it goes into post. And when it goes to post, it comes back to me. And then the, the Sesame Street band, which has been the same 10 guys 
for 10, for 12 years, uh, records it. And then we, they, we sort of match it together with the vocals and put it to film and uh, mix it, master it and get it out the door. That's pretty much the process. That being said, that process takes like, you know, nine months, but um, between demo, filming, editing, mastering, you know, but, yeah. um, but that, that's pretty much it. And I bet that was a learning curve during <laughs> these times that we're living in right now. Absolutely. I mean, it was a learning curve to begin with, but now uh, yeah. we, we record remotely. So the drummer records and then the bass player records and then we marry those together and then the horns do it. So it's, it's become uh, quite a process, but we, we've done it. And now uh, it seems it's very efficient at this point, you know, after 12 years, you sort of figure out how something works. So now, now we've got it, but it took a while for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. So most recently, we, we've done some interviews regarding Don Quixote, and you want to talk a bit about that show and what musical palette that is and what's that like? Because that's, sure. that's a little younger, so to yeah. speak. So I've been working a lot with Spiffy Pictures, who also do Nature Cat and also do Don Quixote. And for those that don't know, Spiffy Pictures is run by the Rudman brothers. Adam Rudman is a television writer. His brother, David, is also a television writer, but more famously is Cookie Monster and uh, a bunch of things with the Muppets. But they make incredible shows. Uh, uh, they teamed up with the Fred Rogers, with Fred Rogers Productions to make Don Quixote. What Don Quixote is, is about a girl donkey puppet, or a girl donkey, who's also a puppet, and uh, her misadventures with her friend Purple Panda. And um, it's very well done. It's very smart. It's very funny. It's one of my favorite things that I do. And sonically speaking, when I first started talking to them, I was like, you know, I know what Fred Rogers sounds like in the same way I kind of knew what Sesame Street sounded like, but I wanted to make something that was different. And so like, for some reason, and I don't know why this is, but like sort of like seventies era soul sprinkled with like acoustic pop singer songwriter kind of all mushed yeah. together to sort of create what Don Quixote is. And I didn't, I don't know that I set out to do that, but like, as I sat down to write the songs, that's sort of just like what it became. And the good part, the, one of my favorite parts about working with them and Fred Rogers is like, they love humor. And so anytime I could write a song that led to the funniness, if you will, of it all, like that to me was the most successful thing. And so I try, I try to find like the funniest genres that I possibly can, or maybe a genre that doesn't necessarily fit what you might think so that, uh, it just, it comes as a surprise. And I think that that sometimes makes for the best possible song. One of my favorite songs from the show so far, because it's still going, um, is one that one of the puppeteers wrote, Mel Campbell. Like, mm -hmm. The Bob Ski Bounce, that was so yeah. fun. It's a great song. Mel came out of nowhere. He was like a puppeteer. He was like a helper puppeteer. And then he told them he could write music. I got on the phone with Mel. We talked for a while. And now he writes for Sesame Street, too. And he's a very, very talented guy and the nicest guy ever. So, yeah. Yeah, but that had, like, such a poppy feel to it. Like, Absolutely. There aren't a lot of, like, like real pop songs on that show. It's more, like, folky and acoustic, like you said. And then there's the sleepover song, mm -hmm. the gamble for the soul. Yeah, part of it, but that's fun. Um, so what do you like recording? How do you record those um tracks? Because that's a lot of remote stuff. Yeah. So the way that works is uh, uh, we have a vocal coordinator. Her name is Crystal Hall. She's incredible. She will Skype or whatever Zoom with everybody in Chicago and in the recording studio, make sure that the they get the vocals and then all of the songs for Don Quixote. I make on my computer for the most part. Sometimes I bring in people to do certain things like play the piano or the guitar or something like that. But for the most part, I make them all here. And um, that seems to work so far. And uh, uh, yeah, um, it's pretty convincing that it just comes from a computer, even though it sounds like it doesn't. So uh, I'm pretty happy about that. Can we talk about the theme song specifically? Because that... There aren't a lot of theme songs these days that basically tell the story of the show. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that does it quite well. You want to talk about that? Sure. The, the, the Don Quixote theme song 
The lyrics are, I think Adam and David wrote them. They sent them to me. And then I went back and forth on just like a couple different ideas. And finally, the thing that I came up with that, the, the, what exists now, I don't know. I, I, that was another one of those things. It was really fast. I think I wrote it at my, I have a grand piano upstairs in my house. I just, I think I was there and I just sort of figured out the melody and what the chords were. And then I came downstairs and then this is pretty cool. Uh, I made friends with this guy who's this incredible bass player out of new Orleans. And I was like, Hey, would you be interested in working on this? And I, I sent it to him and he put this whole band together and he sent it back and it sounded fantastic. And, you know, sometimes you get lucky with things like that. And, you know, and at that time, because of COVID and everything, like it needed to be uh, uh, a satellite situation where somebody could sort of just do it like a remote setup. And so they just did it. And he, he lives like he had lived inside the recording studio, like in a, in another room and did the, record all the music and send it back. And it was incredible. And uh, it's truly fun experience. Kevin Scott is his name. I was liking, he's like a, a jam band bass player and he put this together. That's and he awesome. did great job. Yeah. Now was anything with donkey done pre COVID? Cause a lot of it seems to be done during COVID. And yeah, I, I think they, they stopped shooting for a long time. And then once they finally got the go ahead, went back into shooting, but all of, all of Donkey, I believe, was done during COVID. Uh, we recorded the vocal is recorded and was recorded in somebody's apartment. Um, yeah, I, it's all been done like it, in studios like this or just with with very few people. Yeah, because when we spoke with um, Haley and Frankie, they were in their dressing rooms shooting. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it was, uh, we caught them, but yeah. it, was, it, was, um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So one of the things that I wanted to bring up to you today specifically was a song from the electric company. We're going back a bit. So get into your <laughs> time capsule or time yeah, time yeah. So Silent E. Oh. With yeah. James Monroe Igor. <laughs> yeah. How did that come about? Because you have been doing freestyle stuff with him. Yeah. Right? So this, that's that's a great story. So Silent E, by all accounts, is the first song I ever wrote. And I wrote it in my bedroom uh, in an apartment I lived in on Lower East Side. And Chris came, Chris and I were together and Chris Jackson, and he was like, what if it's like a Stevie Wonder thing? So I literally just sat down and started playing that. And he started singing that. And then it sort of just happened. And then uh, James and... Chris had met in a production in California on some musical something or other. And then James was going, was, this was like early days of Aladdin and he would like be doing workshops of Aladdin. And then he came to New York to do something. And that's how he became part of the electric company and part of Freestyle of Supreme. But before that, uh, they were like, blah, blah, blah. What if James is silent E? So we went into the studio and we recorded James is silent E and he just killed it. And it became this sort of calling card for him. To this day, he still says, you know, he's like, I'm the genie from Aladdin. I'm this, this, this and that. But the thing that most people remember me for is silent E, which I think is hilarious. And um, it was, yeah, it was one of the first songs I ever wrote. And it was just, again, one of those things where it's and it, funny enough, when I sit down to play the piano and I just need to do something with my hands, I, that silent E is the first thing I play just because like it's, it's, it just makes sense to me. It's so, so funny how I discovered it. Cause I, I was a fan of the, the chorus that was used in the, the chorus of kids that was used in the video and mm-hmm. they did like a video shoot. And that's how I discovered what the electric <laughs> company was. That's wild. Um, yeah. So it was a fun show. And like, what a weird introduction into kids music. Like I didn't, I never uh, set out to be involved with kids music. It just sort of happened for me that way. And so I feel like Dak when kids music got cool. Like there were things, <laughs> there were things before that, but like when when kids music started adapting or adopting like the top forty styles and kind of digging deep into the archives, that's really when it got cool. Well, I'm glad you think so. You would know. You know more about kids' music and kids' shows than anyone I know. So I, that's that's a compliment, I suppose. Thank you. I, I well, I'm very proud to be knowledgeable <laughs> because there, 
there are some things that I can't stand. Oh yeah, in, of course. In King music, like when, unless it's like just like that cutie, like the the bond billion. Like sometimes it works, other times it just doesn't. <laughs> I think it's patronizing sometimes. Like I think people right. have an I- idea of what kids' music should be, and it's sort of like a. Uh, like too kitty or too or too do this and do yeah. do this and do that when it becomes instructional it it um kind of talks down yeah to the audience and i always say with my composers it's like don't write a song like you're writing a song for a kid just write a song like you're writing a song for anyone and hopefully it will come out you know as something that works for kids but that isn't necessarily in that style you know yeah, and while we're while we're talking about kick music, I want to talk to you about the Usher collaboration with you and Chris Jackson and the ABC movie. You will love that. That's a good story. So that kind so, of life of a kiln too. It did, and it it yeah. So Chris, so we wrote we wrote an initial version uh, of that song, and um, uh, Usher was going to come to the set and record it in like this truck that we had and i wasn't there so he got there he listened to the song he had not heard it he listened to the song he's like all right cool but i want to do it this way and he started just like beatboxing and clapping and whatever so we uh they recorded his version of the song and and like literally four minutes later started to film it and so i was on the phone with one of my with a vocal director named Paul Rudolph. And uh, we were talking back and forth. We were like, what's he doing? Da, da, da. I think it's just going to be this. He doesn't want to sing the version of the song. Da, da, da. And so he, what came out with was essentially our melody and our song, but like with his own sort of groove and own sort of thing happening. And it actually wound up being really cool. I think, you know, most people know Usher for his like super produced, like smooth R and B yeah. stuff and this was like not that it was like totally like bare bones just like beatboxing and clapping and it really was super fun and people love that song and you know you know we write songs about the abcs in kids music all day long and so for it to have some sort of fresh different approach i thought was really interesting and it's still to this day is another thing that people really love is that particular version i i think that's something that my niece really reckoning. She always asked me to put it on. She always like, <laughs> you're, you're it's guys, a classic. You guys are doing something right. <laughs> so what are some of your favorite songs from other writers on the street? Because you've got this team. Do you want to highlight a few? Sure. Um, some of my favorite guys. So, so there's this team called, uh, there's team J.P. Rendy and Catherine Rayo. They're particularly fantastic. They wrote that brush song uh, about teeth brushing. There's uh, Toby Lightman. Uh, she she had a bunch of songs in like the late '90s, early 2000s. Oh and then, yeah, yeah. And she's awesome. Um, and then you know uh, Greg Wells more recently. So Greg Wells produced The Greatest Showman. The perhaps you've heard of it. He did stuff for the new hike. He, he did stuff for the heights. Yeah. Yep. And he's fantastic. He's been writing songs for us as well. Uh, he wrote a thing for Casey Musgraves. And then we just came out with this great song for Juneteenth that he wrote with his wife, Nina. And it's incredible. Um, And then, uh, yeah, who else? Um, uh, Didn't Lack write a few too? Lack has written a few songs over the years. Craig Thomas, who's the original showrunner. Oh, we know him. How I Met Your Mother, right? Um, uh, Who else? Um, Eli Bolin, who's like a Broadway guy. Shana Taub, who's also a Broadway person. Um, Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, those are the people. Like, what are some of? Or is there a song that came to you and sort of surprised you because you asked for one thing and then they just? Oh yeah, that happens all the time. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about Sesame Street. It's it's sometimes I will tell the composer what I think it should be. Other times I will go out of my way to not. So they'll be like, "What should it sound like?" And I'll be like, "I don't know." And and just to see what they come up with. And sometimes it will be totally off the mark. And that's rare because, you know, like like I said before, we've been doing this for such a long time. People kind of know know where the where the the good spots to hit are. Um, uh, But sometimes it'll just come back. and It'll be wrong. And like, I'll know it immediately. So I'll call them and be like, this is awesome. This just isn't right for this moment. Um, 
And then more often than not, people just nail them. And, and I, I, I also don't like to give people too many pre notes because I feel like that stumps creativity. You know, like if, if they're going to write, if they have an idea of what it should be, then who am I to s- tell them it's not that, you know? So that's how I kind of approach it. Yeah. I love that. People don't seem to realize how adjacent Hamilton and in the hike are to Sesame Street. And even Freestyle Love Supreme. Yeah. What, what's it like bringing your friends in? And what are some of your favorite examples of that? Well, I will say that it's wild to live in a world where, like, my job on kids' music, my work in theater, my work in performing in theater, producing records, and da da all is very weirdly intertwined. Um, I try, you know, it, it's sad to say that the only time these days that I really get to see my friends is if I'm working with them. So I will go out of my way to figure out ways to make that happen. So bringing James onto Sesame Street or the Electric Company and Chris as well and Lynn, you know, so Lynn, uh, initially Lynn got cast to be on Sesame Street and then they called me to write the song for him for Sesame Street. And then since then he's written songs for Sesame Street just because I wanted him to and he was into it. Um, Same thing with Lack and same thing with Chris and James and, you know, even Anthony Viniziali from Freestyle Love Supreme and he and I have collaborated on songs. Uh, Jelly Donut from Freestyle Love Supreme has as well. So uh, uh, I try to, you know, and then I get to hang out with them and I get to check in with them. Utkarsh on Bootkar also from Freestyle has written songs for Sesame Street and stuff like that. So, uh, oh, and and, my, and working with Questlove, uh, uh, Questlove Supreme, he's a big Sesame Street fan as well. And so he and I have worked on a number of projects together, including Sesame Street, which, is, which has been pretty great. And even you brought, I think it was a couple months back, you brought in Anisha and Anthony to do a little video. Yep. That was fun. Totally. Was so that was like, was that like something like, oh, I want these two to do it? Or Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it was a lot of the hip hop stuff, like when we're doing those, those battles for like, um, what do we call them? Elmo's rap battles. It bringing in my friends who are great rappers, you know, they're totally into it and they, they, they love it as much as I do. So. That's cool. Uh, I love that. Like, that was so fun. Because Good. Because it's like, it's interesting. People people see me as this kid show encyclopedia, and you know I'm much more than that. But it's, uh, <laughs> but it's like, it's so cool to see my interests kind of cross over. Mm-hmm. And that happens a lot on the street. So, Absolutely. Well, I'm glad. Uh, that means a lot coming for you. That's great. So let's talk about Freestyle of Supreme and, you know, finally bringing it to Broadway after, like, many iterations. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know. Because you're coming back. Yeah, and also, uh, it just got announced a couple hours ago that we won a special Tony Award. uh, That we're receiving a special Tony Award for Freestyle of Supreme, which is pretty cool. Congrats. Yeah. Um, You know, Freestyle Love Supreme was always this thing that I did with my friends for fun. You know, we just like we made up raps and we hung out and we got to see each other. And then, you know, we made like four different television shows. One was, you know, sort of more of like us doing live stuff. One was more scripted. Like we had all these television shows. None of them seemed to ever catch on as much as the live show did. So finally, we're just like, screw it. Let's do the live show on Broadway. And we did. And I, I'm amazed every night when I go play in that show and people are there and we're going to go back this fall and do it again. And it's, it's just, you know, again, it's another fun way to hang out with my friends. And I happen to be lucky enough that when I hang out with my friends, we get to do a show on Broadway, which just sounds absolutely ridiculous coming out of my mouth, but that's what it is. And that's how we work. And so, so, you know, whatever it takes for us to hang out. And it's interesting because one of the members of the team is, Local to me, Kayla. We went oh, yeah? to the same high school. Which oh, wow. Is sort of funny. That's and, funny. And we live like, we grew up like five minutes from each other. That's wild. So, so that was a fun chat. But, um, like, bringing those new members in, is that cool for you? I love it. I feel like, like, uh, Freestyle Love Supreme is like a mecca of really talented people. And it's, there's very few people 
in the world that can do that kind of stuff. And so bringing in new people and having like fresh takes on things and fresh blood and like fresh ideas is really cool. I love it. I, I, every time somebody new comes into freestyle love Supreme, it's also good for me because it like makes me stay on my toes, you know, like I, um, I'm ready to, uh, to sort of help complement that person. And, and, and because they're always bringing something new and it's not just the same stuff we've been doing for like a hundred years. So that, that I love. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope that I can go see it when it, uh, it would be great to see you. I don't, I don't know. Cause I've heard that the venue isn't wheelchair accessible. Oh, I think it is. Is it not? You should call them. I'm the, gonna do the that. The booth. Yeah. I want to make sure that I can get in get and out. Get in there. So, um, so what was it like? randomly being roped into doing a podcast with Questlove. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that story is fantastic. So so he and I met doing the Hamilton cast record and we were in the studio one day and it came out that I worked for Sesame Street. And he said, oh my God, I want your job. You have the coolest job ever. And I said to him, oh my God, you're, you have the best job. I want your job. And so uh, he, uh, we, we hung out and during the their record making process. And then he called me one night and he said, Hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I was like, I don't know. What am I doing tomorrow? He's like, you're the first guest on my podcast. And I was like, okay. And he was like, come to uh, 30 rock and we'll interview you in the band, the, where the roots rehearse for the tonight show. So I went, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <clears throat> and uh, I was in there for like four hours. I thought it was going to be like an hour and a half. And so like for an hour and a half, we talked about Sesame Street. He played me some things from Sesame Street I never heard, blah, blah. And then for three hours, we just talked about anything else. And it was so funny and I couldn't stop laughing and I had no business really being in this room. And then like two weeks later, he called me back and he goes, so uh, you're going to be on the podcast full time. Just show up when I tell you to show up. I was like, like, okay. okay, okay. And that was like five years ago. And so like since then, you know, we've interviewed everyone from like Dave Chappelle to, you know, he interviewed Michelle Obama. Is that Obama. when you and I met? Um, oh. Possibly. Yeah. Okay, I think it just started. Yeah, it was wild. And he, uh, and so, and you know, we've been all over. We, we went to Minnesota to interview, you know, the revolution from Prince's Revolution. We went to LA to interview whomever. And we just do all this crazy stuff and we interview these great people and it's really fun and exciting. And it's like just something I never thought I'd be involved with or had any business being involved with. And there I am. I love it. And I'm an <laughs> avid listener to it. It's, very, okay. it's, got a, it's got a very fun atmosphere and it's like you're there. And that can happen with a lot of podcasts. So. Yeah, for sure. So a couple quick hike questions before we wrap up here. Okay. What, you know, Hearing Jimmy Schmick sing one line, what that had quite the presence on social media. Like, like, were you there when he recorded? Like, I was. He was. He was. So he, he doesn't. He's great. So Jimmy's one of the nice guys in the world. He does not consider himself a singer, but uh, if you look at his TV history, there are parts of LA Law and parts of The West Wing where he does sing. Uh, just like randomly in the episode. So uh, Lynn and I always used to watch the West Wing particularly and be like, oh, he can sing. But um, uh, he came in, he was nervous. I just sort of sat with him for a while. We're like, dude, this is just like no problem, like blah, blah, blah. And he did that one line, but like 15 or 20 times. And then finally he nailed it and he got really confident. And then he would sing in like, like the background parts of Alabanza and other places. And he was just super into it. And he was super, you know, even at, at his experience level and professionalism like he was still willing to take risks and take the plunge as it were and so he was game to do anything and he said the nicest thing to me at the opening the premiere he said he said you know all talents aside like you just instilled with me a, a willingness to uh, confidence to do this and that was the best thing that I was taught during this or something like that and I was like well that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me so thank I, you I and, love that you know, because people are literally like Losing their mind over that one. I know. And he, and he crushed it. It was great. It was really great. And the other quick little thing I wanted to bring up is 
the new original song for the credits. Mm-hmm. Almost summer. Like, when did you hear that, and what did you think of it? So I heard an early Lynn demo of it a long time ago, and he was like, "Anthony's going to sing this, and Leslie's going to sing this, and then Mark Anthony's going to come out of nowhere and he's going to sing this." And we were all like, "Okay," but like you know, sometimes Lynn's but so when Lynn makes a demo, it's the. Uh, it's very easy to hear the future. Sometimes it's not blah, blah, blah. And then he brought in these, this great producer named Truco who does a lot of reggaeton stuff. And we all sort of developed it and, and, and it, it turned onto the song. And it was a song initially where I was like, this is a perfect end credit song. And then the more and more you listen to it, you're like, actually, it's just a really good song. Yeah. And, and, and it's just like, it's like one of those things where like three or four times and you're just like, this is a great song. What can I say? And like, and to, to Lynn's credit always like he, his his ability to find rhythm and hookies and hooks and catchy stuff is just like is 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 you know genius in every level. And so that song particularly for me, it was not something that I knew, thought that I would like, and now I sing it all the time. So, and I think a lot a lot of times there aren't movie songs nowadays that could be pop hits anymore mm-hmm. like there used to be, but I feel like that's definitely one of them absolutely that could be. Absolutely. So, if I remember correctly, Lynn was and still is a big Rent fan. Absolutely. So, having Daphne Rubin Vega do vocals and just be in the film, what was that like for you guys? So awesome. Because, like, every time she sings, all you can hear is out tonight, right? Even now, yeah. like, a hundred years later, every time she says anything, all you hear is take me out tonight, tonight, you know, and she's the nicest human being in the world. And like, we are like, we're so in love with her. Cause like I saw the original cast of rent in 1990, whatever. And, and she was there and it was unbelievable. And so now she's just like, you know, when someone, when you, in your life, when you are like a fan of someone and then you go and it turns into being like a colleague and a friend is like a really nice experience. And particularly with her and, but she's just like, she's just down for it to be great. And Jimmy Smith was like that too. He's just like, he wanted to make the best possible thing. And so to have people like that, who've had these like tremendous careers come in and like be as gung ho as you are about the thing that you're making is just really cool. It's just really cool. And Daphne had seen in the Heights and like was part of the whole, group and she was just there and her energy was right and every time she's like when she sang carnival to barrio we were just like holy shit like it was just like unbelievable you know so so yeah she's she's just one of the great great greats i'm you know as soon as i saw that casting i go yeah yeah this is gonna be good (laughs) yeah she's she's unbelievable really unbelievable so real quick tick tick boom back coming back coming um, yep, so Tick Tick Booms comes out in the fall. And that's on a smaller scale, right? There you can Yeah. Like, I mean not like a big blockbuster. It's just a Netflix film, but tell me about that musical style, that palette real Sure. Fast. It's definitely it's definitely like a big film. Like Andrew Garfield is in it and he's Yeah, brilliant. but uh. not to the you know what I'm saying? Yes. It's, it's not like it's 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 strange to go from in the heights to yeah, Tick yeah. Tick Boom because they're very different. Absolutely. Um but uh uh, sonically, so so for those that don't know, Tick Tick Boom was uh, what Jonathan Larson wrote before Rent. So there definitely is some like early Rent e tendencies yep. in Tick Tick Boom, but essentially it's about him turning thirty years old in nineteen ninety. So if you can put yourself where you were in nineteen ninety and what the music sounded like, it's sort of like the musical theater version of that. And so there's some rocking and there's some you know some synth wave david bernie type very stuff. some like rem kind of stuff yeah for sure yeah. for sure and and so we took it and kind of turned it on its head and started to make it like big and like you know grandiose as possible for that particular time while still sort of living in you know his uh world of of that that time you know and still a lot of it takes place on a stage so we tried didn't want to get too big like it was too big for the stage but anyway the music is you know his songs are unbelievable so like turning them into turning each of the songs into like a pop hit was ultimately the challenge and was ultimately really fun thing to do and really like flush out everything and add more guitars and add more beats and stuff like that and it's really it's really it's a really well-made film and lynn 
So Lynn is the director and having this be his first thing was really fun and exciting thing to do. And a great way to sort of come down off of the In the Heights thing was to work on this sort of like what feels like a, like an indie film with a non-indie film budget. So it's I it's feel a, like it's more of a passion project, but not really a passion project. Uh, it, it depends on who you ask. I, I, it's, it's certainly a passion for him and certainly a passion for us too. Cause this is honestly when Lynn and I were roommates in the early two thousands, we would listen to tick, tick, boom all the time and sort of reenact it. And so like, this feels like the perfect, you know, ending to that particular scenario. And that coming out in the fall. Yep, on in the Netflix, fall. You got it. Um, I think it's got a small theatrical run too, if I'm correct. I think so. Next player. So where can people find you on the internet? Where can people connect with you? Uh I'm on Twitter, B Sherman two 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 four two four twos. Same thing on Instagram, and my website is popmusicmisery.com. So come say hello. And I just want to thank you for always being supportive of our work and what we do here and connecting with us too. It's really awesome. Bob, anytime. You're awesome. And I will, I'm happy to talk to you whenever you want. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye, buddy. The DJ Bob Show. Pop culture, past and present.